While inflation may, may be leveling out, right now it's raising prices at an average of 7% over last year. From mortgage rates to grocery bills, life is obviously more expensive. Jackie Porter is a certified financial planner at Cart Wealth Management, and she joins us now on how to manage in these uncertain times. It's great to have you here in the studio. It's so awesome to be here. IRL, we were talking about. IRL. In real life. Yeah, for the kids, that means in <laughs> exactly. real life. That's right. Well, okay, inflation at 7%. You've no doubt been in regular contact with your clients. How are they faring? I think some are faring better than others. I think. Uh, people I find, and, and this is also proven by FP Canada, people who work with planners tend to feel a bit more confident, but the people who are coming into my practice um, who are having an opportunity to talk about their current financial situation, the pain is real. And some of the things they're saying is that they bought a house during the pandemic and um, felt like you know money was coming in, cash was fairly free flowing, mm -hmm. their money was on lockdown pretty much. and. And realistically speaking, they're worried about their mortgage renewing. And, you know, maybe they took a three-year mortgage and they're thinking, will I be able to continue to afford to live in my home, is some of the things I'm hearing on the street. Were your clients, like many people, in as much as over the last two, two and a half years, some of it under lockdown, they were saving a lot because you couldn't get out and spend it? Correct. H having said that, there's some research that suggests that people haven't spent much during the pandemic except for when it comes to buying homes. So hmm. mortgages actually make up three quarter of uh, Canadian household debt right now. Our debt, to, yeah, our debt to income ratio, I think I saw a number the other day, 180%, which is yes. <laughs> pretty high. Now, when interest rates are very, very low, that's not problematic. How about now? It's, it's problematic because I think people were feeling pretty good and they were doing a pretty good job of savings because the good news is it was up to almost 1.87 per dollar of mm. income earned prior to the pandemic coming on. So that just before the pandemic, you know, debt was at a all-time high. So it came down, finances were in lockdown. But I think what happened is people got really comfortable taking on debt during the lockdown, potentially buying homes. And that's troubling because if interest rates continue to go up, um, they're relying on their home continuing to go up. And we're seeing with interest rates going up, homes prices are going down. Mm -hmm. So even in selling the house, they might not necessarily have a scenario where they have more cash on hand because the house might not be worth what they were hoping it would be worth. So that's something to consider. In which case, do you anticipate that people's debt levels are going to get a lot worse before they get better? They're going to get a lot worse. I think that especially now, if people aren't getting in front of this, thinking about what their actual cash flow looks like, because a really big thing that happened during the pandemic is people were saving. They didn't have to think about it. They also didn't have to think about spending. Right? right. So now they're not necessarily looking at their balance sheet. They're not necessarily looking at how much money is going out and how much money is coming in. They might be worried about it, but they're not doing anything about now, it. Why not? What, what is the what is the mindset that says, well, you know, we're just going to continue spending tickety boo and we don't worry about how much is coming in? I think sometimes looking might be as painful as <laughs> for, for people. Right. Yeah. So just thinking, let me have a closer look at this. Maybe what they find out they'll not like. Maybe it'll mean that they'll have to make decisions because some of the people I'm talking to now are like, can I afford to stay in my home? Will it be a scenario that I'll have to sell? There is some emotion tied to that. And sometimes it's easier to talk through something like that with someone than looking at your numbers yourself and maybe not liking what you see, right? We don't like to make decisions, do we? No. Better to put it off for another day. No, no. Rather worry about it than do something <laughs> about it, right? All right. Let's put this graph up here because we're going to just show some... We're going to show some of the uh, brutal reality of the last little while. Bank of Canada interest rates hike. Okay, from April 2020 until March 2022, so it's basically during the, the, the worst of COVID, interest rates were almost at zero, 0.25. And they have been climbing up ever since. 1% in April, then 1.5% in June, 2.5% in July, and now we're sitting at 3.25%. I know your clients, you say you don't, they don't like to necessarily make decisions, but, but this is a decision that is facing them stark in the face. So how are they regarding this? It's, it's concerning. I mean, I think people are, are kind of facing the double whammy of seeing costs of everything go up, including, you know, groceries, gas, all the essential items that they need, and seeing their investments go down. <laughs> We're in a market mm -hmm. that's been fairly volatile and just worrying about also seeing that their income, real income, and you know, for a lot of Canadians, real income hasn't gone up. It's done nothing. So, yeah. so that's really putting them in a scenario where 
their debt's creeping up, and you know, they're, the Bank of Canada and CMHC is predicting that people are going to start having a scenario where they're they're not going to be able to afford to stay in their home, and, and debts are going to be defaulted on. Well, some worse than others, and I and I point that out because we are. We are a people that still likes to own a home, right? That's right. Sixty-six percent, I gather, of adults uh, in Canada own a home, and fifteen percent of Ontario owners, homeowners, own multiple properties. Fifteen percent own multiple properties. Um, how many of them are your clients, and what are they saying right now? <laughs> well, I, I think even so, I have some clients who are multiple property owners, myself included, and I, quite a few of them who have been playing the markets taking the extra cash flow that they have. Because Canadians, you're right, we, are, we love our homes and we tend to regard our homes as piggy banks. That's how we ended up in this mess, right? We started taking on more debt than the Americans over the last few years because we kept thinking home prices were gonna go up and up. The reality is, as interest rates go up, fewer people are in the market to buy and demand and supply say, there's, your home price is just not gonna continue to do that. So it's really time for people to take a real close look at if you're a Canadian looking to buy a home right now, is that going to be re a reality for you? Should you buy a home now? Interest rates could can double. Could you afford mm -hmm. to do that? So living within your means is, is something that I think more and more Canadians are waking up to, especially as they're seeing if you're not doing a budget, guess what happens? You, your debt levels just keep creeping up. So one day your credit card statements where people, Canadians tend to like to put the money that they um, don't have mm -hmm. on, and then they just keep seeing that continue to go up and it just makes your lifestyle unattainable. So this is just a good time to take a real close look at your circumstances. Consider, you know, is it still a viable option to own a home, especially in the desert of the city where <laughs> homes are particularly unaffordable? Potentially look at other options. I mean, there, there are options like maybe living, renting in the city if that's your desire and owning a property elsewhere. Um, it's definitely a good time to know your numbers. So. Don't wait till the pain is real. Like, don't wait. I, I'm the person who goes to the dentist when the pain is real. <laughs> I'm not a good example. Do not wait till the pain is real and you're seeing it a struggle to actually pay those bills. Okay, so you be the Novocaine right now <laughs> and, and, and make the pain go away. But in doing so, I mean, what do you think you are really going to have clients who are going to sell their homes because they're worried they're not going to be able to keep them over the next period of time? Well, I'm seeing that right now. You're seeing it. They oh, are yeah. selling their homes. Yeah, some people are selling their homes. Um, potentially more multiple homeowners, hmm. but that's just the beginning. The, I mean, as I said, the closer people get to the reality of getting beyond their means and seeing it in real time with their credit card balances and real income not going up and everything else going up, there's made major decisions, hard choices that need to be made. I wonder if there's a silver lining here, Jackie, in as much as we know that there are lots of millennials who've been trying to get into the housing market and they have been saving as best they can and maybe, you know, tapping the bank of mom and dad a little bit for yes. a loan or some for some <laughs> help is. there. Yeah. Uh, but the prices have been just so crazy they can't get in. Well, if prices are coming down right now, is this their shot to get in the housing market? It, you know what? It very well could be. And what I'm seeing more of is millennials teaming up to buy property. So perhaps, um, you know, friends getting together with other friends um, and setting up a con like a contract on how they would do that because there is an opportunity. But again, the reality is, are you going to do it on your own? Are you going to get a property that has a place with a, uh, a basement or an opportunity to rent out? And the other piece is, is you really want to talk to a mortgage broker long before you want to buy a property because the other issue is the auditing concern of the bank of, of, of mortgage brokers is they're, they're worried that if they take on the wrong client in this market, that, that it could end up being a scenario where they're audited hmm. and just because they want to make sure you meet those stress test requirements. Sure. So if you're a millennial looking to buy a house, make sure you can meet those test, stress test requirements, not just for a mortgage broker, but for yourself. Again, recognizing property values may not go up the way they used to, also considering that interest rates could continue to go up. Could you continue to afford? What's your plan? Have a plan. Uh, is there much of this phenomenon going on where people are actually losing their mortgages because they can't pass the stress test? Is that happening? Well, they're not losing the mortgages. I'm, I'm saying more to get into the housing market. Okay. I think that mortgages will continue to renew. Um, there won't be any issue, at least as far as I can tell, hmm. with those terms changing. It's, it's a question of when people get their mortgage statement and, and it says, here's our offer. You know, it's 5%, it's 5.5%, and you were paying 2.2%. 2 
that's a real wake up call. You bet. That scenario you just gave where, where let's say a couple of people who on their own could not afford a house, but they team up and they decide to buy a property together. Financially, that makes perfect sense. Actually, does that work? Well, you have you raise a good point. I mean, there's a lot of, of um, legal things to consider, like the other person getting married, or you know, um, a pa someone passes away. What happens? Someone wants to sell. What happens? There's yeah. lots of things to consider. So something like that should not be done without getting proper legal advice and talking through the scenarios on how you would react. Hmm. How, how flush do you have to be right now to get into the housing market? Because the prices may be better, but the rates are going to be higher. So what's the advice there? I, I think, again, get, get the advice of the mortgage broker, because I mm -hmm. feel like that sand is shifting all the time, mm -hmm. and, and the um, circumstances, the climate around that is changing all the time. So just assume that, um, you know, in the city is a lot more expensive. There's going to be a lot more requirements that you're going to need to be able to afford a home in the city. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's where you need to buy. Like, again, look at your options, potentially... Mm -hmm consider buying in a more affordable area where work-life balance might also be a, a better priority and your real income might have a chance. Hello, Hamilton, Ontario. <laughs> I right? don't know. Is that the case? Well, listen, I know, I know, uh, I mean, we've had people who work here who, uh, and I know people who, you know, live much of their life in midtown, downtown Toronto and decided, you know what, I can buy twice as much house for half as much money in Hamilton. And if you don't have to come into work every day anymore, why not? Very, go. very good point. I, what I'm seeing as well are uh, millennials in particular buying out in like places like Windsor. And well, that's live, really far. Yeah. yeah. But, but they can buy a place that they can build equity, yep. maybe, some, maybe some passive income, and live in the city, rent, continue to rent in the city. So it just, again, thinking through your options, don't wait till the pain is real. Yeah. Having a plan is really, really important, and that all-important emergency fund. Now more than ever, it's important to have that fund so that if things slip under your feet, you have uh, footing, especially with jobs, people's job situation changing all the time. Do, will they have a job, you know, with all these big tech companies laying off? If you're one of them, what's your plan? Okay, the emergency fund. Yeah. So you get paid. Let's <laughs> assume you got a job. You get paid. Pay yourself first, right? Right. Pay yourself first. In other words, save. Right. Should that emergency fund be a separate something that is not part of your regular savings account, not part of your regular checking account. It's a different thing? It, it's a different thing. It should be three to six months of your lifestyle costs, which again, you need to know what they are sure. to make this all make sense. Um, but three to six months of your lifestyle cost, preferably these days, uh, the good news is that people can get higher interest rates on savings accounts, yep. short-term GICs, things like that. Who knew that we'd finally be in a scenario where we'd have real returns on GICs again? But that's a good place to park your short-term emergency fund, and it really should only be used for what I'm talking about, not for your consumer purchases, mm -hmm. but for a real emergency. That, so that is a serious rainy day fund that you don't chat, you, you don't dip into that because you want a new TV set. That's something you, you put it over there and you don't touch it. A hundred percent. And and actually and doing that exercise, I really encourage people to really put your pen to paper because your mm -hmm. financial expenses have likely changed since the start of the pandemic and you probably don't know what everything costs anymore. Right. So you will have some comfort in seeing the numbers, seeing what everything is costing and then having a plan from there. Now, there was a time, I guess there's been a long time, that uh, you know if anybody was going to put money into guaranteed income certificates, people would say, that's very unimaginative. But I guess we're in a situation now with interest rates rising that these the GICs are coming back. What can you make now in a GIC? You can make, um, I mean, some more competitive institutions are offering up to 5% for five years. Um, on a shorter term, you know, 3.5%. So hmm. this is actually a time where it's not keeping up with inflation. It's not keeping up with inflation, not in no. The sh not in the short term. But, you know, over 30 years, inflation tends to balance out and it's around the, you know, 3%. Uh, mark. So hmm. for the short term, it's a great place to park your money because who wants to bet on what inflation is going to be in the future? I don't. <laughs> right. I think the, the key thing is to, to basically set aside that money, know you have it, so that you have some way of dealing with uncertainty. Safest way to go right now, I guess. Well, next to savings bonds, which are which are still paying still nothing, not, right? Still not paying very much. Still paying bubkas. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, keep going. Other advice for savers right now. If we really want to sort of work on that emergency fund, if we want to save up, again, potentially for a house or just to make sure we have that balance in our lives, what are you recommending? 
I think just delay making any other major purchases that you don't, that isn't a need, hmm. right? You know, again, this is a time to really know the difference between what a need is and what a want is. <laughs> A lot of people don't get that difference, do they? No, no, and yeah. I, I remember I used to do a financial literacy course, and it was for really young middle school kids and in, in one of those neighborhoods where um, at-risk youth, like people who are at-risk at youth lived. Mm -hmm. And I remember a young lady I, that I was asking the question to, what's the difference between a need and a want? And she's like, a need is something you really, really need, and a want is something you really, really want, <laughs> right? <laughs> and there's a lot of my clients and lots of people who don't know the difference. That's very funny, <laughs> except it's not, but it's, it is. Yeah, but not. it is. Uh, okay, you're in the financial planning business. I don't know how much you get paid to dispense your advice, but presumably there are gonna be some people out there that need advice and can't afford a financial planner. What do they do? I think that there's actually um, Plan, I think it was Plan Canada. There's a, a few organizations, charitable organizations out there where you can get advice for free. There's credit counseling. If you're someone who's struggling with debt and you, you're concerned that you're gonna be able to pay your debts at the end of the month. So there's mm -hmm. credit counseling, there's lots of places. Advocates actually, Advocates, which is an organization I belong to, is has a service they had through the pandemic where they were offering free financial advice to uh, business owners and individuals that needed help during the pandemic. So, you know, definitely check out the resources. Check out, search Google free financial planning and just see what's available to you. If you're looking to make a change in your current circumstances or you're worried about the fact that your lifestyle may not be sustainable. Right. How does it work for most financial planners? Do they sort of take a piece of every action or is there a flat fee it's that a, they it's pay? It's a or? flat fee. Typically, mm -hmm. um, financial planners charge a fee anywhere, just depending on, you know, your the complexity of your financial circumstances. So um, it, it could be an hourly fee, it could be a flat fee, as I said, maybe for a certain amount of meetings. Mm -hmm. But you can definitely definitely search, again, advocates, or you could also search FP Canada, search for financial planner there. It's a great uh, resource to see you know, what's available, different types of planners, what do you need help in? Because you can get people that specialize in everything from divorce to women to business owners to couples. Hmm. So definitely search there. And That's the average, this may be proprietary information, so forgive me if it is, but the, your clients on average make how much a year? On average, clients make somewhere between, let's say, like 125 and, and up. <laughs> you're, so you're in the higher end of things. Okay, gotcha. And are you turning that 125 into 250? Well, you know what? I think people understand that wealth is about building wealth or passive income over the long term, whether it's for retirement or, you know, for um, a big purchase that they may want in the future. But I think it's all about wealth is about consistently looking at ways to build income. Mm. That's the big difference between get rich and wealth. Right. Understood. We got 20 seconds left here. Uh, I know these are really miserable times for a lot of people who see their paychecks purchasing less and less with inflation being as high as it is, difficult time maybe to get a better job in order to improve your economic circumstances. What's the one thing you'd tell people to do to improve their economic circumstances? I'd say take action. Don't stay in your head. If you're somebody who's worrying about your finances, and even now, even during the pandemic, FP Canada put out a report that said people were more worried about their finances during the pandemic than about the pandemic, about a health issue. Huh. So I think that this is a time where circumstances have gotten even more precarious because we were spending less. Some people are going back to work, they're coming out of remote, they're having to spend money on lunches, driving, gas, all of those things again. Mm. So it's time to, to really put pen to paper, know your numbers, and feel good about your circumstances. Build a plan for the future that you can rely on. Good stuff. Jackie Porter, Certified Financial Planner, Cart Wealth Management. Thanks for coming in tonight. Always a pleasure, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.